First sermon this morning we read from James 1. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he who observes himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Did any of you sit down this New Year's, and I know it's several years, several weeks past the New Year, uh, but I'm going to talk about it today because we have our annual, vo- annual voters meeting today. But did any of you sit down and write out a list of things you wanted to get done for this year? You know, maybe some of you are, are very meticulous like that. Did you have a list last year? You know, did you have a list of stuff you wanted to get to last year and included stuff like fix the roof, put in a fence, save more for retirement. You know, to-do lists are good. But those aren't the to-do lists I'm talking about. The to-do lists I'm talking about in connection with our text, which tells us, are you just a hearer of the word or a doer? Are the things that God says you should be working on, more importantly, like, did you have on your list not worry so much, I should work on that, pray more, be more content, have more chaste thoughts, spend more time in God's word. If you had made a list of all the things that you should have worked on, you know, all the relationships you should have worked on, all the things about yourself you should have worked on, if you had made a list last year, how many of those things did you actually work on or make any progress on whatsoever? If we really sat down and thought about it, of course, we'd all realize, oh, yeah. If I was going to be graded, I'd get an F. Our sermon theme this morning is that our sins always be before us. And it continues then, very importantly, I'm going to get to the second part in a minute, but also God's justification of us. Some people really do have their sins always before them, like David talks about. Um, in the passage we're going to get to in a minute. He said, my sins are always before me. Some people, they just can't get them out of the brain. They lie there at night, all their failings, all their shortcomings, perceived or real, running through their mind. They go through each one. Other people, at times, you know, don't really think about their shortcomings. Maybe they purposely work hard to stay busy so that they don't have to think about all their sins. And of course, then there are the Pharisees, and we can all be Pharisees. I don't think, yeah, I didn't do much. I did pretty good last year. I'm going to do pretty good this year. This is the resolution that we should have for this new year. I mean, you can have other resolutions too. You can have a resolution to, you know, eat more vegetables or, you know, read more books. Fine, good. But if you're looking one from the Lord that He wants you to do, Let your sins and failings always be before you, but let Christ's justification also always be before you. This is a balancing act. Any of you have kids? uh, You know, a lot of the seesaws now are lame. They have those things to hold on to, which kind of prevents you from uh, having as much fun with the seesaw as you can. But as you, uh, if you were little and you had a seesaw with just a flat board, do you ever try and, you know, you have kids with different heights, different weights, try to get it so that you're perfectly balanced, you know, so the bigger kid gets closer in to the fulcrum so that, you know, it stays level? That's a fun game. Keeping your sins, but God's justification, his forgiveness of you, that's not a game, but it is a skill. It's a skill that we should all learn. It's really important. Because what happens if you're not doing one? What happens if you are not keeping your sins before you? Well, then you're not appreciating your Savior and what he did for you. Then what Jesus did for you isn't something you savor and are thankful for. Then you're not trusting in the Lord. Oh, yeah, sure, maybe you, uh, maybe you use the word Jesus. Maybe you call yourself a Christian. But you're really not 
thanking and loving him for forgiving his, your sins, you're like uh, Joel Osteen, using the word Jesus, but what you're really trusting is, oh, if I do pretty good, Jesus is going to make me rich. That's not the real Jesus. If you don't have that, your sins always before you, you will not know the real Jesus. You will not appreciate that he's forgiven your sins. If we do not have our sins before us, why go to church? If we do not have our sins before us, our faith, what we have of it, is going to be like an ice cube in this hot summer. So they're going to melt away because you do not need a savior if you do not think you have sinned. But what also happens if you have your sins always before you, but not Jesus' forgiveness of you? You know, what if that's your teeter-totter? What happens to you then? You are one miserable person, aren't you? Now there are, and because we Christians, we humans in general, are bad at balancing things, whatever it is, but especially at getting this balance right before between our sins and our forgiveness, we are often going like this in our life, aren't we? You know, really feeling the guilt of our sin and not seeing our forgiveness, and then the Lord restores to us the joy of salvation, and then we're like this again, and then we're going, you know, we're going this and this. So we're not always good at getting that balance. And so the Lord tells us that to not forget that who was scourged and whipped for our justification, bruised for our iniquity, chastised, so that we are forgiven. We should keep that before us, but also our sins. Not, not our sins before us, now that we know that Jesus was punished instead of me. He gave the perfect sacrifice. They no longer have, they shouldn't make us feel guilty anymore. We know we did them. We know we should, did wrong. We know we deserve hell, but we see Jesus took hell. And so we see our sins and rejoice that Jesus has forgiven them. And we can learn from them instead of forgetting them. That's not what God wants us to do. Be like, oh yeah, I made a mistake. I'm not going to learn from it. It's forgiven. Is that what God wants? We should have our sins and God's forgiveness of those sins always before us. Now, as individuals, you know, we should be doing that. And, you know, some of you have come to me and talked about things you've struggled with and continue to struggle with. It's before you, and I assure you of forgiveness, and you keep that before you. And I always encourage you in this new year to do that as well. But what about as a congregation? What are our feelings as a congregation? Now, obviously, I could not make a comprehensive list of, that, of those sins, right? But one thing that has been on my heart for quite some time that, that we need to better better with is accountability. Being there for one another in our struggles. Some of you have come to me, talked to me about the things you struggled with, but that's always the tip of the iceberg, you know, the... They always use this as the proverb. You know, the problems you see, that's just the tip of the iceberg. What is it? You only see one-fifth of the iceberg? Four-fifth is just hidden? If a few of you have told me about things you struggle with, how many have not told me, or other Christians, sought their help with the things you struggle with? If you know all these things that you are struggling with, that you are sinning with, and yet you're not coming to your fellow Christians for help, God tells us to. James 5, confess your trespasses to one another. Ephesians 4, which God talks about how he gave to the church all these different people for the equipping of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come to unity of the faith. There's this story about this man, you know, he's, he's by this cliff, and he slips off, and he manages to grab a root, and he's hanging from this cliff, and he's praying, God, send me help, save me. And this, there's another person walking along, and hears this, hears this man pray. And he runs to his car, gets a rope, throws it over, and says, Grab on! And the man, hanging for his life by this root, calls up, No thanks! God will send me help! It's kind of amusing. We're that person. We're the person 
hanging by our fingernails, praying for God with help, and ignoring the help he sent. Now, you know, this graphic shows someone, you know, hanging by their fingernails and represents what they're hanging from, you know, a house and doctor bills and stuff like that. So that's earthly stuff. And we can be struggling with earthly stuff, you know, with our job, with medical bills and stuff like that. But as a, as a church, I'm more concerned about the other struggles because as God tells us, our biggest struggle isn't against flesh and blood, not with mortgages and stuff like that, but against the power of darkness. Satan in a sinful world, which would deceive us and bring us to perdition. That's our greatest struggle with sinful thoughts of a wide variety. We each struggle with different things. Those are the things we're often struggling with, whether it's, whether it's worry, whether it's, whether it's chaste thoughts, whether it's contentment, whether it's bitterness. We had that seminar a few weeks ago or a couple months ago now. And we need help. And we pray for help often. And yet, so often we ignore the help God gave us. He told us repeatedly. He gave us the church, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, to help us with this. To be there, to support, to encourage one another when they know what's wrong. To assure you of the forgiveness of sins when your teeter-totter, your seesaw gets out of whack. To assure you of your forgiveness of sins, if it's this way. Or to point out your sins and rebuke you, if your teeter cotter goes this way. <coughs> to hold us accountable. Because over and over again, not even in church things, but in secular things, even if you're talking about alcohol anonymous, who are far more likely to succeed? Those who have a support group. Those who hold you accountable. Who check, are you drinking? Who encourage you when you're feeling the temptation? God gave us brothers and sisters in Christ to do that for us. And yet we're so often sitting there trying to do it ourselves. Why? Well, there's tons of reasons, aren't they? One is just pride or shame or annoyance with our fellow church members because they hurt us this way or because they did this thing. We don't want to go to them with help. And so we don't confess as the Lord told us to. We don't seek help as the Lord told us to. We sit there alone, pridefully thinking we can handle it or too ashamed to tell others and Satan has divided and conquered. And so we come back to our theme, to this resolution. Let your sins and failings always be before you. But let Christ's justification be before you always. That's what's going to change our behavior. Knowledge of our sin and our forgiveness. So we don't sit there alone trying to handle these problems. Either because we don't think we're sinners. Or because we're just not motivated to seek others' help. When we know our sin and our forgiveness in Jesus because of his life, his perfect sacrifice, that's our motivation to be there for one another and to seek their help. So that that is our future. A bright present and future. <coughs> we're knowing what we're doing. Yes, our past is dark. We all have many failings and sins in our past. It doesn't mean your future is dark. It is without Jesus. But you have Jesus. You know your sins. You have heard what Jesus did to forgive you. You've heard how he has plans for you to prosper you, to give you purpose and work every day. And part of that work is to be there for one another and to seek out their help with the things we are struggling with, so you don't have to struggle with those things alone. Your future, with our sin and our Savior ever before us, is not 